In our last lecture, we learned the foundations of qualitative analysis, including a basic approach to analysis that involved coding and writing memos. This time, we're going to dive deeper into qualitative analysis and explore some variations and adaptations on that basic model. This is definitely not a comprehensive assessment of all qualitative techniques, but it should give you a good sense of some of the options you have for your own project. We're going to start with grounded theory and then talk about discourse analysis, conversation analysis, narrative studies, phenomenological research, content analysis, and process tracing. That's a lot of methods to review, so let's get started. Grounded theory is the most closely related approach to the basic approach we discussed last time. In our basic approach to qualitative analysis, we focused on coding, memos, and interpretation. You collect your initial data, build a set of categories that represent potential points of interest or interpretations of that data, and start coding the data according to those categories. You write memos, noting your interpretations and insights of the data. As you go through the process, you'll add more categories and seek more data until you reach that saturation point where additional data doesn't add much to your analysis. You then review your categories and memos for higher levels of meaning, patterns, themes, or points of interest. Grounded theory is going to take this process and provide a more specific purpose and format. Let's start with purpose. In general, grounded theory is an inductive process of generating a theory grounded in the data you've collected. Unlike the work we've discussed so far, it's pretty explicit in grounded theory that you probably shouldn't start with a theory. The goal of the approach is to develop a theory rather than to test one. It may be impossible to be completely devoid of ideas and assumptions at the start, but generally you shouldn't be going in with the idea of testing a pre-existing theory as you would with most of the other kinds of research we've discussed. In fact, in grounded theory, you might even postpone conducting a literature review and not do one at the start to preserve this inductive process. You want to approach the data with fresh eyes that aren't overly influenced by what scholars already know about that area of study. You do conduct a literature review eventually, but you would do it later, after you've already independently developed the first ideas of theory. In some cases, grounded theory may even ignore our rule that you start with a research question or problem. You might work with just a general phenomenon of interest. I know, this flies in the face of everything we've discussed in the course. I warned you in the last lecture that qualitative research tends to be less linear in its adherence to the scientific method. I eased you into this by talking about commingling data collection and analysis, but you didn't think it stopped there, did you? Nope. Grounded theory pushes two of our earliest steps, the literature review and generating theories and hypotheses, and moves them to the end, to after data analysis. And it goes after our previously inviolable first step, coming up with a research question. Look, you've reached lecture 23. It's about time I revealed an important secret about research methods. To paraphrase Pirates of the Caribbean's Captain Barbosa, the research methods, rules, and codes of behavior aren't so much rules as guidelines. I've given you a set of procedures to follow that are widely accepted in practice, and yet still up for debate. Not everyone uses research questions or theories or hypotheses. Some argue that neutrality, one of our key characteristics of good research, is impossible, or that it results in particular subjects or research itself being ignored or marginalized. Research is empirical and focused on observation of reality, but interpretivists would argue that there is no objective reality to observe, that everything is subjective. The practice of research can be messy, and new debates, critiques, and techniques come up all the time. At this point, you've learned enough to be able to assess for yourself the value of the different techniques we've discussed and which will work best for you. And you're ready to start challenging the rules we set out as you reflect on all of the assumptions we've made along the way. So with those caveats, let's get back to grounded theory. According to one of its principal founders, Barney Glazer, quote, grounded theory is the study of a concept, end quote. 
The goal is to find the core concept that's embedded in the data that can have broader implications beyond simply describing what is in the data. Glazer offers as an example the concept of credentializing or documenting expertise. While this was based on a study of nurses, the concept of credentializing, once identified, has been much more broadly employed in a variety of fields and contexts. So theory and generalizing from it is an important part of this research process, but it comes at the end rather than the beginning. The practice of grounded theory is pretty structured. It can be done by a single researcher or as part of a team where multiple people engage in regular consultation during the coding process. As with the basic model, you can engage in triangulation, using several sources of data to see if your findings apply more broadly. You'll also engage in the commingling of data collection and analysis, with the analysis informing future choices regarding data collection. For example, the coding process might lead you to want to interview a new set of subjects or to ask different questions of previous subjects. You probably should still start with a question about your phenomenon of interest, but your question may broaden or narrow as you go through the grounded theory process, so you should be open to changing even your question as you engage with your data. Once you have your question sorted, you should start collecting data. Uh, this data can come from a variety of sources, records, interviews, observation, fieldwork, texts, focus groups. It depends entirely on your study and what you have available. You don't need all of your data to start, just enough to start coding and thinking through categories. But if you like, or if practical reasons demand it, you can do all of your data collection before you start coding. Once you have at least an initial set of data, it's time to start coding. Remember, we usually don't wait to have all our data, we start the analysis right away. In grounded theory, there are three stages of coding. Open coding, axial coding, and selective coding. In open coding, pretty much everything you can think of is coded. You aren't typically starting with a theory to inform your coding decisions, so you might not have a preset set of codes going in when you start coding. The codes will evolve throughout the open coding process. In open coding, you identify all possible concepts or interpretations found in the text you're studying. You may have hundreds or thousands of codes at this point. You shouldn't restrict yourself in this stage. You're describing your data so you can begin to make analytical connections. Throughout the coding process, you'll write comments and memos to yourself that outline your ideas, possible concepts, connections, hierarchies, and relationships, anything else that you think of. This is, as we discussed it before, very stream of consciousness. Remember, memos aren't meant for an audience, but for yourself as you develop ideas. But it will be very helpful to organize your thoughts this way so you don't lose sight of the forest for all those coded trees. Memos are actually a great idea no matter what kind of research you're doing. Don't think you can only write them when using grounded theory. Anytime you're taking notes on the literature, during interviews or observations, or just thinking through theory, you should write memos to yourself that clearly delineate your thinking at that time. They can be invaluable tools to structure your thoughts and ideas as your project develops. Sometimes I get ideas for a project at the weirdest times, like when I'm driving to work or sometimes while I'm sleeping. I'll dictate them immediately using a recording app on my phone just so I have those ideas for later. Okay, so you finished your open coding, having written a bunch of memos. Next up is axial or theoretical coding, which is where you start considering relationships between the codes that you developed in open coding by identifying categories. You might look to see which codes occur at the same point in time, or sequentially, or other correlational factors. You might note which ones appear again and again, or are particularly emphasized, or tend to overlap with other codes. You might be looking for causal relationships, processes, or context as you build meaning from the open codes. You'll compare categories for similarities and differences, develop subcategories, link categories together, and consider data that doesn't fit neatly into these categories. The final stage is selective coding, which is where you integrate the categories from axial coding to identify the core category, the fundamental phenomenon represented by the data, as well as how it interacts and intersects with the other categories and subcategories. You're developing a narrative of the process of how these categories connect to each other. The goal is to identify this core category, the concept you're trying to study, the variable of interest, or a pattern that explains the outcome or process you're interested in. 
As with the basic process, this coating process continues until the point of saturation and the identification of the core category. You may want to diagram your results showing how the subcategories and smaller concepts either contribute to the core concept or are caused by it, or the consequences of the core concept, or recommendations on how to respond to the core category. You will at this point begin engaging in sorting. This is where you sort your memos to help you ultimately build your theory. It's at this stage that you'll also consult the literature to assist you in developing the theory as you can spot connections between what's outlined in the literature and what you've discovered in your data. Let's look at an example of grounded theory in practice. Uh, we can do this with something we're familiar with, caring for our teeth. Alexandra Sparani and her colleagues published an article in 2011 about using grounded theory to explore preventative care practices in dental offices in Australia. They were interested in following up on their previous study that looked at the use of preventative protocols rather than the more traditional fillings to address tooth decay. Their initial study found that several dental offices in the treatment group, the ones that were supposed to use the preventative protocols, didn't fully implement the treatment. Building on this finding, Sparani and her colleagues decided to do a grounded theory study to understand why these dental offices didn't implement the preventative protocols. They started by interviewing the dentist, staff, and patients at one of the treatment locations in the initial study. After every interview, the researchers engaged in extensive memo writing, noting important findings. They began coding based on this initial data, both individually and as a team. Early on, they determined that the process of finding evidence about new procedures and products mattered to dentists. During open coding, Sparani and her colleagues noted down when someone referred to looking up evidence, talking to peers, reviewing the literature, and similar language. In the axial coding stage, they made new codes to represent these behaviors called seeking out evidence and gathering and comparing peer evidence. In the selective coding stage, these were combined again into, quote, the process of making sense of evidence and construction of knowledge, end quote. The team continued this process, conducting interviews, writing memos, coding, and evaluating codes. The research focus changed along the way to a broader interest in the use of preventative protocols in dentist offices. This created new questions and interests. The team interviewed the first set of subjects again, but also moved on to talk to other study participants, including those in the original control group, until they reached the saturation point. Ultimately, the team was able to increase our understanding of how incentives, barriers, time, and reasoning affect the implementation of preventative protocols in dental offices. This is important because the original experiment aimed at seeing the impact of those protocols, but it's the grounded theory study that helped us understand the context of why these protocols weren't so easily implemented, regardless of whether or not they were more effective. So that's the basic process of grounded theory. There's a vibrant literature on the subject though, and since I already warned you that everything in methods is debated, you should assume that applies to what I've told you of grounded theory as well. Some things to keep in mind though are that grounded theory is not strictly a qualitative methodology. You can use this analytical approach to assess quantitative data, coding it just as you would qualitative data. You will find that grounded theory is particularly useful in areas where theory isn't well developed, as this can be a useful way to engage in theory generation. Grounded theory is also used in many applied fields, such as education, management, and healthcare. But grounded theory isn't the only approach to qualitative analysis. Let's look at a few other ways we use that basic approach that we discussed in the last lecture. Discourse analysis focuses on interpretation and meaning found in communication, in texts. It recognizes that communication is, in its very nature, performative, and therefore words, in whatever format, can't be taken at face value, but must be assessed for deeper meaning. This is therefore a very interpretivist approach, focusing on subjective understanding and interpretations of meaning. The goal is to understand how and why that particular discourse or text, the choice of words and nonverbal cues, was chosen, the purposes they serve, and how they create particular meanings and constructions. So, it doesn't aim at simply describing what someone said, 
but understanding why they said it or why they use those words and not others or what the meaning is and how they came to use that particular form of discourse. Discourse analysis can therefore be used to critically evaluate texts for the role of class, gender, wealth, culture, power, and other conditions in the production of the text. It can also focus on how language is used to establish subjects or objects and the historical context of how that particular set of understandings came about. For that reason, it's important to provide the context of the time and space in which the text was created, as that's essentially connected to its meaning. For example, pro-fascist speeches have a very different meaning and interpretation in 2018 than in the 1930s. Conversation analysis is very similar to discourse analysis and can in a way be considered almost a type of discourse analysis. Conversation analysis focuses on interpreting natural conversations rather than pre-written speeches, debates, or interviews. Like discourse analysis, it often looks at both verbal and nonverbal behaviors. As with grounded theory, the phenomena under study aren't always identified at the outset, but may be revealed through the process of data analysis, although theory and observations certainly play a role in the analysis. The goal is to identify the phenomenon revealed in the conversation, the variation within that phenomenon, and the reasons for that variation. For example, I might examine a post-class conversation between two students. Let's say they're having a discussion about gun control, and I want to assess how they used claims and evidence in the discussion. I might make notes on the condition under which they use different evidence. Perhaps immediately after one person refutes the argument of another, they tend to rely on ad hominem attacks. This might give me insight not only into the specific conversation, but potentially the university is a social institution that facilitates or hinders constructive debate. Here's a famous example of conversation analysis. Sociologists Don Zimmerman and Candace West studied how conversation reflects power and dominance dynamics. They analyzed conversational segments from recordings they made of overheard two-person conversations in public spaces at a university. These conversations included same-sex pairs as well as pairs of men and women. One of their key interests was interruption. They wanted to see if gender played a role in the rate of interruption. Of the 56 total interruptions that occurred in the recorded conversations, 48 occurred in opposite gender pairs, and all but two of those were men interrupting women. This study, it's from 1975 by the way, launched a lot of research into the gendered nature of power and dominance. Now let's talk about a couple of methods where you're still interested in patterns and themes, but are not necessarily going to engage in a strict coding process. The goal instead might be to engage in description, describing cases or phenomenon in rich detail, providing compelling narratives, and identifying worthy themes. Narrative studies focus on telling the story of one or a small number of individuals rather than assessing a small number of texts or naturally occurring conversations. The goal is to report the detailed lived experience of those individuals using their own words and descriptions of that experience. This is often the focus of studies that engage in biography or oral history. It's a collaborative style of research where the subject provides the information about their life and experiences. The researcher interviews the subject extensively and crafts the story, finding an appropriate framework or storyline to tie the subject's recollections together into a compelling narrative. That narrative might be chronological or thematic or follow some other structure. It might focus on particular turning points or epiphanies. The researcher may also use secondary sources to provide context for the time period or setting of the experiences recounted by the subject. The narrative studies approach can enable you to understand the complexity of someone's life and experience that can't be narrowed down to values on a variable. It can also challenge the conventional wisdom on a subject by providing a more nuanced and compelling look at it. Journalism can excel at this. Consider the way in which reporter Ronan Farrow chronicled for The New Yorker the stories of women alleging sexual harassment and abuse by movie mogul Harvey Weinstein and how their stories challenged existing narratives on those subjects.
Phenomenological research is closely related to narrative research. It focuses on exploring meaning in the experiences of people who have, well, experienced a phenomenon. Strong feelings such as grief or anger, uh, graduation from an academic program, serving in the military, playing violent video games. Your options are very open. Essentially, the basic approach of qualitative analysis applies. You gather data from individuals in the form of interviews and other artifacts, analyze them for meaning, focusing on significant statements of how your subjects experienced the phenomenon in question. From this, you can develop broader descriptions of what happened and how, and potentially identify common themes across subjects. This is particularly useful in research on counseling and therapy. For example, maybe you're interested in driverless cars, but not so much the technology or the policies or the cost or the impact on traffic patterns or accident rates. Instead, you're interested in the experience of people traveling in driverless cars. You could interview a small number of people, say fewer than 30, about their experiences, letting them detail whatever comes to mind, such as their emotions at various points, their hopes and fears, their observations of their surroundings, what went through their minds during the trip, pretty much all of their sensations and memories. From this data, you try to understand the commonalities of meaning for this experience by looking for themes. For our next technique, let's go back to that basic approach we learned previously, or at least the coding part of it. Content analysis is a widely used technique to evaluate qualitative data, although strictly speaking, it's not necessarily a purely qualitative method. You see, content analysis is often used to assess data by counting frequencies of particular codes. That word frequency should immediately remind you of descriptive statistics. In essence, content analysis lets you take qualitative data and code it in a way where it can be quantitatively analyzed. You are quantifying qualitative data. Content analysis is usually used to, ask, to assess artifacts of communication. Speeches, news reports, blogs, message boards, social media posts. You determine a set of codes at the start. These can be determined deductively through theory or inductively by initial analysis of data, but you generally don't continue to revise your codes continually throughout the process as you do in grounded theory. You also determine your unit of analysis, whether you plan to count words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books, whatever makes the most sense for the texts you're evaluating. As with other approaches we've considered today, you also generate categories of interest, specific words or phrases, tones, themes, metaphors, people, topics, concepts. Again, whatever makes sense for your research question. The content you're interested in might be manifest, things that are explicit in the text and easily counted, or latent, which are the implicit, hidden, or symbolic elements of the text that require greater interpretation. Either way, you'll need clear criteria for what counts as a particular code and what doesn't count. Then you go through the data and code it or have a computer do it for you. You'll typically start with a trial set of data to test your codes and adapt as needed before coding the rest of your data. With content analysis, you're often looking at a larger body of text than with discourse analysis, so software can really help with searching through texts, identifying context, and organizing your coded materials. Once you're done, you can run descriptive statistics to evaluate frequencies and other interesting correlations and patterns. Content analysis can be used in a variety of fields. For example, one set of criminologists used it to evaluate crime stories on cable talk shows. They recorded every week for six months and coded the recordings for categories such as the ethnicity and race of crime perpetrators and victims, as well as the amount of time spent on the stories, the political affiliations of the guests and hosts, and a variety of other factors. They then conducted a statistical analysis of the data, finding that the gender and race of perpetrators and victims on the shows were out of proportion with actual crime statistics, showing, for example, many more examples of white female victims than statistics would suggest would be proportionate. Let's finish our discussion of qualitative analysis by taking a big step away from the basic approach we've been looking at to consider process tracing. 
Process tracing doesn't rely on coding like content analysis or memos like in grounded theory. This is a method largely used in case studies. As the name would indicate, it's about tracing processes. Specifically, it's about exploring how and why certain outcomes occur. Process tracing aims at evaluating evidence to understand the causal mechanisms that produce particular results, uh, the decisions that are made, the events that transpire. It's very useful in understanding policy and decision making. By diving deep into data on a specific case, the researcher can dig into which variables matter and which don't in how a particular outcome occurred. This can be done deductively or inductively and is particularly useful in historical analysis. As political scientist Andrew Bennett puts it, it's like a doctor diagnosing a patient based on evidence of symptoms or a detective solving a crime. You assemble the information and trace the causal process from start to finish, looking at all the variables involved in an attempt to tease out what's going on. The main goal is to evaluate potential causes and subject them to a variety of tests to determine the role they play in bringing about a particular outcome. These tests aim at determining whether these causes are necessary or sufficient contributions to the outcome of interest. By necessary, I mean that the variable or factor must be present for the outcome to occur, but that the factor alone is not enough to produce the outcome. Other conditions are needed. A sufficient cause means that if that factor is present, the outcome will occur, but it can also occur under other conditions. If a factor is both necessary and sufficient, that means that both apply. It must be present for the outcome, and its presence alone is enough to trigger the outcome. Factors that are neither necessary nor sufficient can be ruled out as important causes of the outcome, which allows us to eliminate alternative explanations. Therefore, process tracing is a useful way to test for causality in qualitative case studies. Bennett gives us an interesting example of process tracing. He uses it to try to explain the peaceful end of the Cold War. Since the Soviet Union had used military force to preserve communist governments in the past, it was surprising that it didn't do so in 1989. He looks at three sets of possible explanations drawn from the literature. First, that the decline in Soviet economic power in the 1980s led it to scale back its foreign policy commitments. A second explanation focuses on how power shifted among Soviet leaders from those heavily engaged in the military and defense sector to those interested in approving economic relations with the West. A third explanation argues that the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989 made it reluctant to use force again so soon. Bennett subjects each of these explanations to multiple tests, sorting through the data to determine the relative weight of each. As with so much research, the answer isn't simple. We can't necessarily pinpoint one of these explanations as the single correct one. But his analysis does show that the second explanation about the shifting control of power within the Soviet Union is the least supported by the evidence that he found in the written record. As with quantitative methods, we've barely scratched the surface with qualitative analysis. There are so many other approaches that deserve more time and space. Feminist methodology or ethno-methodology, for example. And each of the methods we've covered here could have its own lecture where we cover all the debates and variations you can employ. Our goal here, however, is simply to introduce you to a variety of analytical approaches so you have some sense of your options. What you choose will, as always, depend on the nature of your research question, problem, or overall area. We have one final task that awaits us. You've finished your analysis. Now it's time to communicate your results to the people who need to know about it. Our final lecture will show you how to do exactly that.